I listened to the new uh, Dropkick album a couple times, Turn Up That Dial. Uh, really, really great album. Thank and, you very uh, much. I wanted to get started talking about a few of the songs, uh, beginning with the title track. Uh, I really like that. It seemed like it was a, an ode to the bands that you guys kind of grew up listening to. And uh, I'd love to hear more about that song. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in this year, for me, 2020, music was more of an escape for me forever. You know, I just put in the headphones, the earbuds, close your eyes and think back to past concerts of seeing bands you like or, or, or just other times in your life. And, um, you know, the, the music that that shaped shaped you and made you believe that you mattered or made you believe that things could be different or made you believe that you were just going to have a good time that night or whatever. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be deep, but, you know, music definitely played a huge role in my life and, you know, most people's lives. And, you know, it's kind of about those memories and just thinking back, you know, and I think the overall you know, tone of the album kind of kicks off from that spot, you know? Cool. And uh, another song I wanted to bring up is uh, the new single, Middle Finger. And uh, it's also a kind of a fun one about maybe a guy who's a stubborn guy who has kind of F you attitude. And even though he's had all these kind of missteps during his life, he still has kind of has that attitude. Uh, love to hear more about that one too. I mean, I think, for me as a kid, I would have prided myself on being a guy that, you know, just told you, spoke my mind, told you what I thought, whether it was going to make my life worse <laughs> or not. As you grow older, you know, uh, you hopefully attain the ability to find more moderation on when and when and when not to speak your mind or whatever and you know sometimes as you become a full adult you realize it's just not worth it to fight every battle but even if you would make it to that point in your life there's still that part of you inside that just wants to say oh and i just thought that the middle finger reference was just that you know because it can be going up it can be going down and that was just a metaphor for that feeling in life when you just you, you, you basically life is straddling that line of like, you know, do I rebel or do I conform? You know? Yeah. And, uh, another one I wanted to bring back, which I enjoyed since last year was, uh, Mick Jones, Nick, my pudding. <laughs> and it is really a, a fun song, but like, you know, obviously you're singing about Mick Jones from the clash. And I, from what I heard, it's a story that a, a friend of yours that told you that actually happened. And, uh, but that said, uh, is it kind of strange? Cause it's kind of like a never meet your heroes type of song, but yeah. obviously the clash, I know our heroes to, to you guys and, and dropkick Murphy's. So yeah. are, is there any hesitancy in singing a song like that about, about Mick Jones, knowing that you guys are such fans of, of, of yeah. So, so to be clear and go on record, there is the double entendre of that never meet your uh, idols, but not directed at Mick Jones per se. I, I never have met Mick Jones. We, we met Strummer a bunch of times and, you know, I don't know, on a personal level, Springsteen, Strummer, you know, just that ability to connect with people, be down to earth, you know. Uh, so I assume the rest of his bandmates were the same way, but a, a huge impact on us as, as a person. But the story stems from our producer, Ted, was working in a studio in, in England that had a common area where multiple studios uh went and 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 he, ted put his pudding in the fridge and uh with no and, and mixed defense no didn't put his name on it or anything and mick just thought it was the pudding for the studio so he ate it and <laughs> ted is a very soft-spoken guy and ted tells us his story where he sees mick with the pudding and says oh you no know, ted's british too he says oh that's my fucking pudding put it down when we all knew fully well, that's not what happened, you know? <laughs> and uh, so Ted told us the story and, and then we, we were in pre-production for the record and everyone went to lunch. And I said, I'm going to stay back. I got an idea. And you know, they came back from lunch and Mick Jones, Nick, my pudding was born. However, you know, the other side of that is not the clash, but we've met a lot of our idols and some of them have been amazing and blow my mind. And some of them have been 
bigger douches than I could ever imagine. <laughs> and that's the risky run. You know what I mean? And there's been a few albums. I'm not going to gossip and mention names, but there's a few albums that I went home and threw out after meeting the people, you know? So, so you do run that risk, you know, but in, it was funny because in the video for that song, we made, it's a cartoon and we really did make the Mick Jones character out to be that kind of guy, you know, but we haven't heard from him on it, but just to go on record, no disrespect. You can have all the pudding you want uh, on behalf of Drop Murphy's. That's great. That's great. Great story. And uh, one other uh Song. I'm not going to do every song, but one other song on the album, uh, Chosen Few, very topical, you know, d- deals directly with the political divisiveness in this country. It deals with the pandemic, how the past administration, uh, you know, approached the pandemic and treated the pandemic. Uh, can you talk about that one? Because that one's a real, uh, you know, really speaks to these times in, in, in America. Sure. So. Over our 25 years of touring, um, we've always had a very firsthand know. It's basically the song is basically about America, uh, the world's outside view of America. And we've had a very firsthand knowledge of what the world is thinking uh, of America throughout all the times in our career, you know, whether it was uh, going into Iraq, um, all different moments when we'd be touring Europe and suddenly, you know, someone's yelling something out at us and we'll say, hey, you know, we didn't make that decision. But so we've had this little pocket of knowledge and now I feel like it is open for the everyone to see what the world thinks of America, you know, and how they've handled the past year, the past four years. And, um, you know, and I, I guess, you know, our standing in a lot of ways isn't what it used to be. You know, people might argue that, but from what I see and from my travels and stuff, that that's, that's what people are feeling. And so it was just kind of a take on that. And it covers, you know, listen, I, the whole, idea of this album was kind of to be uplifting and positive not look back and lament 2020 and the virus and everything because everyone's been doing that you know and we all want something else to think about and look forward to and by the same token you know i don't think we wanted to give donald trump that credit to say oh if you know you dominated our lives in the news for four years like well i'm not gonna give you the credit of singing about you you know but but i guess he couldn't couldn't get away without anything so you know i felt like um you know some sort of responsibility to document what happened but even that we tried to do in a like fun way you know yeah yeah and i wanted to talk you know as a band who's kind of like bread and butter is playing live shows who have such a huge connection with your fans i've been to a few of your shows and uh you know what has it been like, you know, a quarter century of touring and then just having it come to a standstill, uh, both personally for you and for the band to not be able to get out there and, and, and tour? I think like everybody, we've had to, everyone's had to balance the, um, you know, the change in, and hopefully try to have some moments where you can view the glass half full instead of half empty. I mean, obviously it was a dramatic shock to you know, what motive, taking away what motivates us, taking away our livelihood. But at the same time, you know, 25 years of touring and we have kids and stuff, you know, I, I, I've i never had this much quality time home with them. And I always have this like feeling, I don't know if you can identify with this, but like every August when I was growing up in school and you know, school was coming back, I'd start to get this like anxiety in my stomach. And touring's like that a little bit even though we're thrilled and we can't wait to do it you still know you're leaving home and so there's always this bit of a mixed emotion so my point is even if I had three months off you know the first few weeks when I get home I'm kind of trying to catch up and you know pay bills and your mind just not settled back into being home and and then and then the month before you go you're thinking about the next tour so this this kind of gave us the first time in a lot of bands take like breaks over the years, you know, we've never taken a break. So this was that first time where we didn't have a pending tour. We didn't have anything looming. So it was just like, be home, be with the families. And that had some positives to it for sure. Um, As we just came up recently on the anniversary of the last tour we did, you know, like every day I say people would be posting on 
you know, Instagram or whatever on their stories. Uh, one year ago today, and you would see a story of their clips shared and you go, holy shit, man, I missed that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you'd see the, you go, that was a year ago. Holy crap, man. So like the connection to the people is where we get the payoff in music for us being a live band. So, you know, playing a live stream or releasing a record is great, but it can only go so far. And to me, until we get to go play those new songs in front of people, the real thing isn't happening, you know? On that note, was there any hesitance in releasing uh, this new album, you know, this spring, knowing that touring, you know, for the most part, it was looking like, you know, fall at the earliest. Uh, did you guys think, uh, you know, should we release an album in, in the midst, midst of a pandemic that's still going? Well, we did have thoughts, but we were supposed to release this in September. And then we sat on it. We sat on it. We said, we can't sit on it anymore. I, I, we got to put it out. And in the meantime, we wrote a bunch more songs and we we're about eight songs into a new album. So we feel like, one, we couldn't wait on this. We wanted the people to have it. Two, we feel like we'll be able to follow up quick. If the touring doesn't happen for a while, we'll have actually another album, you know. I wanted to go back to last year because I remember watching the uh, the uh, concert from Fenway Park. And just, can you just talk about that thrill of just playing on the infield of, you know, the Boston Red Sox and then having the boss Springsteen like join you on the jumbotron, just like I mean, I can't. Ima it was magical just watching it on YouTube. But for you guys, you know, being in the midst of it, can you just talk about that experience? Yeah, those opportunities are one thousand percent never lost on this band. You know what I mean? And I can guarantee you that at least in my head out there, while I might have even been singing a line from a song, I was thinking holy shit, I'm going to do a slide or I can't believe I'm here. Is there a baseball around they can throw, you know? Um, so we're, we're soaking it all up, man. It was, it was, a, it was an amazing experience. The Red Sox have been so great to us. Springsteen's been so great to us. It's just so down to earth. It's scary almost. And, um, and you know, that day, that day for us will, be in, you know, it's that's in our top five of, you know, things in the band's career for sure. Speaking of top five, you know, this is the 25th anniversary of Dropkick Murphys. You guys formed in 96, so 2021 is uh, 25 years. And is there a moment, obviously you just spoke on the Fenway one, but is there another show or just a moment in your career that's like a highlight that stands out, uh, you know, among the others in the 25 years, like looking back of it? That's tough because there's just so, so, so many. I mean, another one, just to just to go with another Springsteen one, we'll, we're on the topic was years ago. He came and joined us at the House of Blues in Boston on St. Patrick's Day. By far the worst kept secret in Boston history. <laughs> you know, I think the Boston Herald knew about it before we did. You know, it was like in the newspaper. And of course it led to, you know, I think that year we were probably doing seven or eight shows in a row in that venue. And, you know, all of a sudden my guest list, which had been spread out amongst all the other shows, was like, oh, I want to come on this night, you know? And, um, and he showed up to sound check and, um, you know, all our families and kids were there and grandmothers. And, you know, my, my, the reason it's up there for me is so we, we brought Springsteen out for the encore. And so the whole crowd knew it was not a surprise, even though we didn't tell anyone. And so as we're off waiting for the encore, the cold crowd's going, Bruce, <laughs> right? And so uh, Bruce comes out and he walks out my then, she's passed now, but my then probably, she passed at 94. So my then probably, you know, late 80s grandmother on his arm. And, you know, Bruce did a song with us called, uh, recorded with us a song called Peg of My Heart, which both my grandmothers are named Peg, Peg Kelly and Peg Casey. So out comes Bruce with, with Peg Kelly on her arm. And I didn't think my, I thought we we're going to need the jaws of life to pry my grandmother's arm off of Bruce, you know, but like to get to share like a moment like that, where he comes out with my grandmother and, um, you know, as far as other shows, I would probably go back to maybe say like some of the, uh, just to swing in the other direction, maybe some of those very early shows where like, we you know the band started as a dare on a $30 bet. We had no plans in doing it as a band. And then all of a sudden 
those shows where, you, you know, even though it was like small venues, the rat skeller in Boston, but you got that reaction from the crowd where I went, Oh shit, something had, do these people actually like this? Is something happening here? You know? Um, you know, so those early days of just like the, the, you know, alarm going off that, Oh my God, you know, um, this was just supposed to be a joke. You know, those, those are those. And just, you know, far off places going to Japan for the first time going to, you know, Australia. Cause I never went, really left New England before the band. So it was like, how did I get here? <laughs> going to Russia for the first time, you know, like shit like that. It's just, just kind of makes me scratch my head even to this day, you know? <laughs> 